Welcome to BizTech Forward, your go-to podcast for cutting-edge insights at the intersection of business and technology. Join us as we explore the trends, innovations, and strategies shaping the future of the digital world. Let's move forward together. Hello, and welcome to another episode of BizTech Forward, the podcast where we delve into the world of technology and business with some of the brightest minds at Daytart. I am Ani from the Media Relations team, and I get to work with these brightest minds every day. So think of me as your friendly tour guide as we discuss the past, present, and future in tech. Today, we're talking about IT talent and the evolving needs for IT skills from clients. That is, what IT skills were in demand in the past, where are we now, and where are we going? To help us explore this, uh, today I'm joined by Anna Velikoyevanenko, the Global Employer Branding Director at Daytart. Anna, welcome to the show. It's so nice to have you here. Hello, guys. Uh, happy to be here as well. Thank you. Anna has been leading Daytart's employer branding efforts since 2017. Her team provides full marketing support, including media, partnerships, digital strategies, brand ambassadors, events, and internal engagement. They manage communications in seven languages across 12 labor markets, achieving an annual reach of over 20 million people, positioning Daytart as a dream employer. Anna, again, welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, we like to structure the discussion between the past, present, and future. So okay. why don't you start, obviously, with the past. So would you please guide us through the past a little bit? So what skills would you say clients were looking for in IT talent, say, three to five years ago? Uh, well, three three to five years ago might be... Um... A bit of a weird period, to be frank, because uh, in the last five years we've experienced COVID. That has been a total deal breaker for most of us and almost draw us insane <laughs> and a lot of businesses to the ground. I would say let's start thinking about pre-COVID times uh, to be on the safe side. You know, let's uh, go back to the glorious times so uh, you know, we could still go outside and enjoy oh. our lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the good old times. Uh, well, I would say that at that time, the um, IT industry, and well, IT is a very broad term for the industry. I would like to maybe um, uh, specify that we work in custom software development, which is a sub uh, part of the um, whole IT sector. Uh, we were working with lots of different clients. The uh, industry was booming and a lot of clients were looking for team extension and they were working on some long-term projects. A lot of customers were still working on uh, legacy improvements and other stuff that you might not really recognize nowadays because the industry has changed so much. So I would say that back in the glorious 2019, um, a lot of clients were looking for mainstream skills that uh, provided scalability. I would say the scalability was the it word, you know, that was mm -hmm. the buzzword of the industry. So naturally, these are the, um, if we talk about development, those are .NET, uh, JavaScript, Java, DevOps, uh, quality assurance, business um, uh, intelligence, and uh, project management. Um, and uh, well, in some cases, the uh, clients even wanted to manage the teams themselves because they treated them as the um, extension of their own larger team that they had in-house. And uh, you could hardly, hardly um, find a product manager. Uh, for example, a product manager in uh, custom software development were more, uh, was more of an exotic position, I would say. And uh, me coming from FMCG, uh, industry that was a bit weird because, well, I had to shift my mindset a little bit to that. And I would definitely say that we had fewer people with diverse industry backgrounds. Basically, those are mainly engineers working with other engineers, but on the client side. Ah, oh, right. So um, does that mean that um, back then in the glorious days, like you say, <laughs> clients well, kind of preferred more specialized and narrow skills, then there, there was there was not much of a mix. So what would you say? 
Well, I would say that uh, the key thing then was thinking in projects. Uh, people mm -hmm. were thinking in projects, and that would imply that we were looking for compatibility between professionals, that we could unite them in certain units that could de uh, deliver uh, the, um, the outcome to the client that was mostly a, a project. But I would say that both career letters were still in demand. And uh, I would <laughs> say that uh, in custom software development, there are several ways how the um, developer uh, or basically any tech professional could look at his career. So you can either, um, it's a classical, you know, tree, um, decision tree problem. Like in the survey, you know, you have several ways how the events will unfold further on. So if you want to become a solutions architect, for example, and you would like to focus more on tech, then most likely you would be more, um, tech, um, tech, um, diverse persona, meaning that you would be a tech agnostic. You would look at uh, def different uh, coding languages and uh, libraries and tools as a toolbox. Basically, you see mm -hmm. the technical problem and uh, you have a set of tools that you would like to solve and you would mostly be focused on that. Um, another way how to grow uh, would be um, I'm interested in working with people. I would like be to become the team leader and maybe later on I would like to become the um, project manager, for example, or a mentor. Maybe I would like to become a community lead in-house and I would like to um, be very specific in my area of interest being something, maybe internet right. security or something else. And then the third way is that I'm interested in business. I would like to actually um, bring the engineering world closer with the customer world. Then most likely I would uh, set myself on the way to become the delivery manager or maybe uh, participate more in pre-sales. And then I would become um, an expert in a certain domain, be being telecom or maybe uh, healthcare and life sciences or payments or something like that. Um, but I would say that both people with narrow and deep mm -hmm. expertise, as well as um, tech generalists or tech agnostics, whatever we call them, uh, they were all in demand. We could uh, yeah. still, we could still make it work and uh, help people achieve their career career goal, goals in uh, custom software development. Right. That sounds like there was balance, basically. Um, you know. Before we get too upset, you know, thinking about all those beautiful, glorious days of the past. <laughs> oh, that, that's the fun part about nostalgia is that we only remember the good things and we always forget oh. everything else. But actually, yeah, of course, um, it's a joke, meaning that I would say that uh, any um, era in the business uh, or in the workforce market era is basically um, a mirror of whatever is happening at the client's market, at whatever is happening in the respective industries of the clients that we work with. Therefore, I am calling it the, the great glorious days um, because then I would say it was more, again, a problem of scale. People were looking how to make the same thing, but bigger or the same thing, but in a different industry. But nowadays, a lot has changed, but I personally find it actually more challenging, but at the same time, definitely more interesting. Yeah, so very. It's a nice bridge to our <laughs> next our next part, which is yeah. uh, glorious days of today. So, Anna, yeah. what has changed uh, in by two thousand twenty four by today? You know, like what what skills are in demand now? What is the stuff that you would really like pinpoint and highlight? Well, I'm not exactly the um, professional of skills management per se. I'm not work in learning and development. Therefore, I would maybe speak about the same thing, but maybe on a you know one level higher, uh, on demand and supply uh, level of talent and customer needs. Yeah. So I would say that the shift in the in demands that our clients are experiencing is definitely fueled by the needs for digital ad adoption and innovation. Because well. We understand that uh, customer software development industry works um, in order to help our customers grow, to deliver the uh, business grow via digital transformation and innovation. This is our bread and butter. This is why we're all here. This is uh, why uh, people actually want to work with us. And um, I think that uh, whatever we put in the word digital transformation or innovation is actually 
the same that can be reverse engineered into the skills that are in demand. And uh, customers grow their businesses in products. They understand their products and, of course, services and the completion for consumer um, and the competition, sorry, for the uh, consumer on their respective market is driving um whatever is happening in our market. And the competition there is actually quite fierce. We can see that a lot of industries have to uh, recreate themselves and uh, there are so many disruptors in certain industries. We see the rise of platforms, of startups, a lot of things are now being automated. Uh, the, cost, the consumer needs are shifting and the way that we can deliver them um, is, uh, is also changing. And therefore, I think that customers are looking for partners who can bring to the table innovation and prototyping, experimentation, uh, hypothesis-based development. And they need close collaboration with us in order to create product implementation roadmaps. They're looking for not specifically maybe like skills per se, but either the people for the job. And well, um, I think that it's in many ways up to the teams how to define their tool set how exactly they want to do it. And I've seen more uh, than one way how the companies can actually do it. So, uh, for example, if we're talking about transformation of process, you can um, actually go in different directions. You can do it with AI, for example, if you're experts in AI, or maybe you have uh, amazing process engineers who can recreate the process itself and make it uh, much more efficient um, in some other way. Um, and I think that the, class, the customers are also looking for the ways how to propel themselves into the future because they are also not only competing with other competitors, but they are also looking how to recreate their industries. And we are talking industries like retail, for example, or financial services or uh, media and entertainment and so many others. And these industries are all about the level of service that they provide to the customer. So we need to understand how we can rebalance our skill sets, the skill sets of our engineers, in order to improve customer experience. We need to build these bridges ourselves of how we can differentiate ourselves from the market, but how also our clients can differentiate themselves from their competition via the digital experiences that they are creating, basically the things that we are creating for them. So I would say if we need to bring it to the level down, we need to be experts in data. We need to understand modern AI. We need to understand clouds. And we definitely need to be experts in product management and in um, uh, UI, UI and UX, because this is the uh, essence of how modern businesses win their customers. And this is how we can actually add on to the success and be the real partners for progress for our clients. So oh, that makes a lot of sense. And it just makes me wonder um, where does like geography come into play here? Because how important, <laughs> how, how important is it that clients probably, you know, nobody hires locally anymore. We're also global, but so can you, can you comment maybe on like, how um, much more global is it and what does it even mean? Well, I think that the, the custom software industry was one of the pioneers of remote work and globalization in terms of the uh, uh, fight for global talent. And I would say that we have um, experienced it firsthand. I would say that the global expansions of various uh, digital transformation companies started way before it started for many other industries. And we were actually the ones who were prepared for COVID. And I remember even the times during COVID then it was us who were teaching our clients how to manage their uh, remote teams because suddenly everyone has become remote. So I would say that the context here is king in this particular well, case because I cannot say that we have one trend that is universally true to everyone because, uh, well, um, the employers are hiring both internally and externally. Because let's not forget that we also have huge internal markets within every company. And if we're talking about companies that are more than 1,000 people, uh, that means that they do not have to run to the market to recruit for every position or every skill, that they actually also have an internal market. And this is why we have global mobility for the uh, programs if we need 
people to move around. Well, this is why I hope that most of the employers have uh, heavily invested into cloud native solutions for collaborative work for asynchronous comms and stuff like that. But I would say that at the moment, uh, context is uh, the thing that rules it all because uh, uh, there are so many ways how one problem can be solved in in various ways. But definitely at the moment, the power, I would say, is on the employer side because of the um, shifts in the markets, because the markets are fluid. I would say that the employers nowadays have uh, more back bargaining power than the employees. But at the same time, we have um, also other huge meta trends that are influencing us. For example, global remote work is here mm-hmm. to stay. Uh, after COVID, it is not going to disappear suddenly. Uh, and for some strata of um, professionals, this is the only option that they are actually agreeing to because, well, they have rebuilt their lifestyle and they do know that there is a certain um, certain number of employers that will definitely employ them. So I would say hiring locally or hiring globally is, um, is not always a definite answer. It will depend... Mm-hmm. It will depend on the industry, it will depend on the country, it will depend on the skill set that you're looking for. Yeah, actually, you summed up it perfectly in like one sentence. I really like it. I'm taking it with me. Context is king. Yeah, it but is. It is. Because if you just even try to browse the news, uh, you might um, actually um, be very anxious because you're not sure what is going on. Because on one hand, uh, we have... Let's go back to normal in the UK, in the um, private sector, where we have those slogans everywhere that, uh, yes, let's go back to the offices and uh, let's uh, let's fill the city of London with uh, people in suits again. On the other hand, we have thousands of layoffs in uh, different countries in the tech sector. But on the other hand, we see huge M&As uh, that companies are going through. And the people who were... Uh, laid off yesterday are either getting a call from the same employer but under different flags <laughs> because after the m a they've been offered their uh, job back or for example they are being offered the same job as a contractor um, but again it depends so much on the corporate strategy so i would say that uh, we are still in a very interesting part of the um, of the change that is definitely happening and I think that the AI revolution is definitely going to um, uh, to fuel it uh, it more because well the, the the world gets both smaller and bigger at the same time because yeah. uh, we do have access now to many tech professionals everywhere and on one hand we have the rise of payment systems that makes it possible to collaborate with them uh, we have um, legal harmonization but on the other side we have risks we have legal compliance security uh, business continuity uh, risks that are also limiting us so i would say that you know it's a pendulum that is going back and forth it will definitely land somewhere and it's interesting to see where and how the future of work is actually going to look like yeah and real quick before we jump into my favorite part as known as the future i wanted Ooh. you did mention the technology and i just wonder because technology just keeps evolving. We can barely keep up. It's impossible. So how important, like, where does quality of work stand here? Like, how important is reskill, reskilling, for example? Like, um, Well, I think that if you're in the people's business, meaning that if your business, business model is in any way dependent on the quality of service or on collaboration or on uh, creativity, then... Yes, it is important. I would say that reskilling is extremely important. And even I personally uh, already had, I would say, several careers within my lifetime because uh, my degree is not related uh, to this thing that I um, actually decided to pursue in my career. I got a diplomatic degree, but I decided that I want to pursue a career in brand marketing. Then I worked for several years as a brand manager in FMCG. Then I decided that I want to explore the world of tech, you know, and just goes on and on. And I think that it is impossible uh, without reskilling. Uh, I think it's 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 not something new. I don't think that um, that we can actually continue without um, continuous learning in our lives if we want to have um, mm-hmm. interesting. Um, I'm not sure 
how exactly we're going to be impacted by this reskilling necessity in the future. But I'm sure that AI uh, will empower us and reshape the skill sets that we're using. But I am one of the optimists. I think oh. that uh, this reskilling is actually a good thing because I definitely want AI to do my dishes and uh, <laughs> do the mundane part of my work. But I would like to keep my music and poetry and um, all the artistic pursuits to myself. So oh. we should see how it works. It's very nice to be on the same page with you, Anna. Uh, so jumping to the favorite part of mine, as I always say, predicting the future. Um, maybe just briefly, if you could outline, what do you think will mm -hmm. be the most important in the future within within the topic we're talking um, about? I was thinking actually about oh, what what kind of futurologist that can be, you know. And I'm a, <laughs> I'm a research geek. I always try to read some consumer trend reports and so on and so forth. And yes. if we trust the scientists, if we do trust them, they name three skills that are going to be uh, the um, centerpieces of success in the future. And those are creativity, resilience, and leadership. And as you can see, none of them is a hard skill. <laughs> Meaning that uh, I'm afraid that uh, the future doesn't hold any simple answers to tough questions. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, like in the uh, golden era of the 20th century, people who would start an um, uh, Oracle um, integration project in their company were safe, you know, in their career for life because those projects would run for tens of years. I'm afraid they were past that. So um, none of the skills are hard skills. You cannot really learn them by reading a book or taking a course or having a certification. Um, what will it mean for employers and what will it mean for our clients? I think that it would mean that we will need to learn how to think about it holistically. And we will need to understand how to invest into people, but also into partnerships and how to give those things opportunities. Because sometimes you, it is a matter of faith and the bargain that, you know, you, uh, I don't know, hire a junior hoping that this person eventually will become your next uh, CMO or maybe chief innovative officer and you never know but I'm sure that it is worth it and I'm sure that it is about the values and how we click or we don't and I believe that a good partnership is always a two-way street and um, so far the best partnerships that I've seen uh, with our clients and with the best talent that we man managed to retain for years in data art it actually works mutual respect and mutual investment into each other. Absolutely. Anna, before we wrap up, I'd like to um, end this maybe on a little bit of a little bit of a spicy note, also to invite <laughs> our listeners to think awesome. with us. Um, and this section, I like to call it an unpopular opinion. So have you got any unpopular opinion regarding this that you would like to share that comes to mind? Um, yeah, I actually think I have quite quite a lot of them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not, but not for the sake of um of just you know trying to be special or anything. It's just that I like a good debate. You know, it's like a treat for the mind uh, yeah. to look at the, the same subject from different perspectives. And I am a brand person. I'm not a recruiter. Therefore, I understand that my opinion might be a little bit, you know, off uh, from, from the trends. Uh, but I believe that very often in, um, in our uh, selection process, whatever it is, whether it's a partnership, a vendor, or for example, a recruitment process, we focus too much on past achievements of people of uh, different companies. And uh, we disregard completely the potential the potential that might not be quantifiable at the moment uh, that this person or this team or maybe this company or this partnership that it might build to reshape our perspectives. Um, I truly believe that if we create innovation and if, well, Gartner and our biggest clients are all speaking about the same thing, like we want innovation, we want more creative uh, leadership via tech and so on and so forth. If we want this growth, we cannot rely exclusively on the old tools and tricks. We just can't because, well, I'm afraid that it, they have the expiration period. Um, mm -hmm. and 
product. This is how we actually try to hire into our team, to the employer branding team. We do not require specific experience in uh, in employer branding or even in tech. We do not ask people for certifications or degrees and this and that. But we're trying to um, understand the hard skills people have, but also the level of energy, the authenticity, the vision that they have. And I believe that we want to partner uh, for progress. And this progress might come in different shapes and forms. And I believe that success can be different, but the true success, I believe, comes from a true partnership with trust and mutual belief in uh, our own you know, creativity that we can create together. Oh, I love this. What a great note to end this on. Energy, authenticity, vision. Anna, thank you so much for your insights today. It's been a pleasure to talk thank to you. you. And thank, thank, you. You to, thank you to our listeners. Um, if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, and follow us for more. And we always want to hear from you. Thoughts, questions, insights, opinions of your own. Please reach out to us at bistechforward at datart.com. Thanks again. And until next time. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Biztech Forward. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast to stay updated on the latest in business and technology. Join us next time for more insights and forward-thinking discussions. Presented by DataArt.